Okay, well before I get started, uh, I just want to thank Idea Lab for hosting this and obviously the, uh, the sponsors for providing all the, the extras that we have here today and it's really exciting to, to be a part of this uh, series of talks and I uh, want to be able to share some, uh, I'd say not a complete overview of the company, but um, what I chose to do was sort of talk about some of the challenges in trying to build a chemical company from the ground up and then illustrate that with uh, three different uh, two case studies and then sort of a little bit on one of the products that we're bringing to market ourselves. And hopefully that'll give you some of the, I'd say the high points and some of the challenges and I'll reiterate that uh, at different times in the presentation. One of the things you'll see is the highlights is um, in a chemical, in the chemical industry, it's a, it's a long time to market. And that can be anything from, you know, some, some basic chemicals to pharmaceuticals. Time horizons can be, you know, if you're lucky, uh, seven years. And sometimes it's 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Um, I'll show you an example of a case study that's uh, 18 years from the initial work at Caltech till the commercial product just launched three weeks ago in a major therapeutic area. So uh, time horizons can be long and there are a lot of other challenges and we'll try to uh, highlight those as we go through the talk. I have to get this right, because left is advanced and right, it's like I'm in, in England or something here. <laughs> All right, so who we are, we're a technology-driven specialty chemical company, uh, headquartered right here in Pasadena, California, not necessarily the place you'd think about a, a chemical company. Uh, we also have manufacturing facilities uh, near Houston, about an hour north of uh, Houston in, the, uh, in, in an area where there's a lot of petrochemical activities and, and oil and gas activities. About 110 employees, most of those are here in Pasadena, probably about 90 to 95 are dedicated here, and about 15 to 20 in, 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 uh, in Texas, but there's several people that go back and forth, so it's, a, it's approximate, but uh, at least 90, 95 people here in Pasadena. We manufacture and market uh, two lines of products. One are advanced materials, and I'm not gonna go into too much on the uh, detail in the technology. I figured for a broader audience, really show you some of the, some of the products or some of the markets that we're going after. Um, on one of the areas on the, on the uh, pharmaceutical side, it's kind of, I can't not show you some of the technology, but it's not very important. You'll kind of get it from the pictures. It's one of the few times in pharmaceuticals where the pictures actually, you can kind of get it from that. Uh, and, and the base technology, which is our proprietary catalysts. And um, if you remember, for, for those of you who are old enough, uh, BSF used to have a tagline, you know, we don't make the products that you use, but we make the products that you have better. And so catalysts are one of those things that are behind a lot of the products that we, uh, that we interact with every day, but you don't really appreciate them because they're not, they're not something that consumers really get involved with. Probably the closest thing is if you ever had to have your catalytic converter changed in your car and had to say, why does this cost $1,000? It's because of the precious metal catalysts that are in the, in the catalytic converter. But they're in all aspects of the chemical industry, probably about 75 to 80% of the processes out there use catalysts for that, everything from refining you know, oil into, uh, into petrochemical products, um, to you know, pharmaceuticals and everything in between. We were lucky enough that uh, our technology in, in part of the company's uh, history in 2005, uh, our founding professor, Professor Grubbs at Caltech, uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry along with two other uh, professors, and that was obviously a, a great time for us, and uh, it, it, our partnership with him and with Caltech has been, has been outstanding, and we wouldn't, no way we'd be here today if it wasn't for both Professor Grubbs and Caltech and how much they've done for us. And uh, Caltech is just an, uh, is an amazing place. Um, I never realized how, how much was done there with so little resource in the sense of numbers. Um, I'm back, I grew up back east in Boston. I'm used to Harvard, MIT, which are pretty massive institutions. And I, and I came here to, to, to Caltech and it's just the level, same level of science, if not better, and it's a, a fraction of the size. It's a really tiny, intimate place uh, that, that does incredible work. Um, the company itself, we have over 350 issued and pending patents on a global basis. And that's, again, another key theme um, in this talk is that uh, intellectual property is the only way you can maintain a sustainable advantage in the chemical industry. There is no real first mover advantage. There is real, uh, you know, brand. It's, it's, it's all about your intellectual property. And the problem with that is, is that if it takes you 10 years to get to market, um, your patents are already pretty well aged. And that's one of the reasons that pharmaceutical companies, their pharmacoeconomic model is they have to charge so much for... Uh, whatever the medication is because they have to recover that development cost and they have a short period of time to do that because usually the first year after something goes off patent they lose about 90 percent of their revenues to generics and so they have a short window that they're granted a monopoly but once that's gone you know the Tevas and the Wyatts of the world uh, come in and, and, and capture most of their revenue. The industries that we focus on um, uh, in general for licensing it's a broad group of industries but for the materials that we develop we're looking at energy um, industrial and transportation. I won't be able to talk all about those. I'm going to give you a few slides on the energy side, um, but the same kind of things apply to, to energy and transportation. The biggest thing in transportation is lightweighted vehicles. 
So if you can go from steel to aluminum to composites, you're saving significant weight. That translates into longer ranges if you're electric, if you're gas, higher mileage. Um, so there's a variety of uh, factors there that uh, kind of are, are common themes throughout. A bit of a timeline. Uh, we started the company in 1998. Uh, it was probably before we should have. Uh, we didn't know any better, which is probably important. Um, we didn't finalize our license with Caltech until 2001. We actually started working with a company that we wind up acquiring um, back in, uh, whoops, wrong button, sorry, pointer, there we go. So we started working uh, based on a sub-license from this company, Advanced Materials, and we wound up acquiring that company in 2004 and sort of backwardly integrated. But with Caltech, we didn't uh, license the technology until 2001. And in that license, it was a global exclusive. We'll talk a little bit about that. But it really allowed us to uh, really look at all kinds of applications for the technology. And that was a big challenge. You know, if you can do anything, what, what do you do? And uh, trying to understand that is, is very complex. We've uh, done a number of deals that were important to our history, and uh, we did a uh, uh, distribution agreement with Sigma Aldrich. They're sort of the Amazon uh, of chemicals. If you want to buy a chemical anywhere in the world, uh, Sigma Aldrich is a great place to buy it for research. Um, and we started the company, this is uh, a kind of apropos being an idea lab, but it was long before the internet. You know, if you wanted to get a chemical, you just didn't go on the internet and search for it. Um, you'd go pick up an Aldrich catalog, and you'd look it up and see if you could buy it for research. So that's obviously has changed a lot. Um, a large agreement with Cargill back in 2003. Um, back then, uh, I went to school in the Midwest, so I knew who Cargill was, but many people didn't. Uh, it was a pretty, pretty quiet company. They're the, probably the quietest $100 billion company uh, in the United States. They're a global company, and they employ over 100,000 people, but it's private, and they're, uh, they're a pretty interesting company to work with. Some other uh, activities throughout the, throughout the timeline of the company, we'll go into some of these details as we go forward. But early on, uh, we were focused just on the Catalyst technology. It was pretty much a licensing business, and so we were looking for people to partner with and license the technology. We were always gonna manufacture the Catalyst and then license the use of it uh, along with the uh, sale of the Catalyst, so that was our recurring revenue stream. But after we acquired uh, the company uh, that was using the technology to make resins and materials, that's the business that we got into, which is our product business. So we went from a, a pure licensing model to now what's both products and uh, technology licensing. And then uh, most recently, uh, a couple years ago, we launched a branded version of our, of our uh, resin technology to go into a number of applications, in particular energy, oil and gas, and wind. So some of the challenges for chemical startup, and this list isn't complete, but it's probably the big ones. Uh, traditionally, uh, very capital intensive business. Uh, one of the reasons that you don't see, uh, there hasn't been a new refinery built in the U.S. in decades, reason being it's a 25 to $30 billion uh, asset build, so it's very, very expensive. Uh, there's an LNG uh, export terminal that's being built in the Gulf Coast. Uh, I think they're about $25 billion in. Um, so the chemical industry is, is built on very large assets, and so to be a player, you typically have to uh, invest a lot of assets. Uh, it tends to be a very conservative and risk-averse industry. You know, you have accidents, it's a lot of liability. There are companies out there like WR Grace have been in litigation for, for decades based on, you know, asbestos and things like that. So it's, it, they tend to move very, very slowly, and the customers that they work with tend to move very, very slowly. So you have uh, what we say here is multiple adoption risk. I'm never selling to the consumer. I'm selling to a company, they're doing something, they're selling to somebody else, they're incorporating in a system, they're selling it to somebody else and it's selling. You might be four, five, six stops away from, a, from an actual end consumer, and so there's that multiple adoption risk, and it can go wrong at any, 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 way, any stop along the way. There are numerous established global players that are, that are fairly big, and a lot of them are over 100 years old, so they're very entrenched and they have very good networks. Uh, long timelines for product commercialization, that's something no investor wants to hear about. Um, regulatory compliance is extensive, um, and it can be very daunting at times, and, and, and those landscapes change. And then, uh, as I mentioned early on, a robust uh, intellectual property portfolio is required if you want to maintain a sustainable competitive advantage. So to give you an idea of, of Catalyst and the impact they have and sort of the longevity in use, uh, you go back to the 1930s when something, ah, sorry, pointer is up here. When you go back to the 1930s when something called fischer tropsch Catalyst were developed, um, it's a way of turning coal and natural gas into liquids for fuels. Um, it was, it was, uh, developed in, in that time frame and used in a number of different places in the world, mainly developed in, in South Africa uh, by Sasol because they, weren't, they, weren't, uh, they, they were uh, banned from importing oil because of, because of apartheid, and they developed that technology for converting coal into, into liquid fuels. But that technology is still around today. As a matter of fact, uh, Shell, about two years ago, completed about a $20 billion build in Qatar uh, to turn natural gas into liquid petroleum. 
Uh, so the technology you know, is well almost, you know, almost 100 years old now and very little change, but still being utilized. You look at Ziegler-Natta polymerization catalyst, they were developed in the 1950s. There's been some modifications over time, but they're responsible for the largest production of polymers on the planet, which are polyolefins. More than 65 million tons are produced every year. Catalytic converters, uh, they've been around since the 70s. They haven't changed that much. They've been, they've been incrementally trying to reduce the amount of precious metal in them to save money, but they're essentially the same types of uh, catalytic converters that were first developed. And then uh, the Grubbs Catalyst, which was early in the 19, early 1990s, is going to have you know, several decades of, uh, of, uh, of activity in the marketplace. Our technology, um, beside not trying to get too much into, into molecular chemistry, but uh, catalysts basically take an input do something to it, and then convert it to something else. So that they're not a product of themselves, but they facilitate a transformation from one thing to another. And they're, they're used in biological systems all the time. Enzymes are, are, are technically catalysts. So in a, in a catalytic system, you always look, what are your inputs? And luckily, good thing for us, our inputs are one of the most common functionalities in the chemical industry, which are called olefins. They're a carbon-carbon double bond. And they occur in petrochemicals, uh, which are the most common functionality out of refineries. But they're also uh, present in renewable feedstocks, so things like soybean oil, canola oil, uh, things like that. There's quite a bit of olefins in those as well. And so we, we say that we're feedstock agnostic. We don't care where the olefin comes from, but we look to add value by converting that into some value-added product. And there are a variety of products from some of the resins we'll talk about today. Um, all the way down to uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, which is probably the highest level of, of specialty chemicals out there. And we play the important role of basically turning you know, these low-value feedstocks into higher-value products, and, and we try to capture as much of that value in that transformation as possible. The markets that we play in, we mentioned energy, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, I'll talk about pharmaceuticals in, in one of the licensing case studies, um, and then talk a little bit of, on uh, another platform technology that uses renewables, but we play in the transportation area as well as in industrial and, and the classic chemical industry. And so most chemical companies are pretty broad in, in how they, in, in how they uh, work in the, in the marketplace. And in general, we have cost advantages, higher performance, as I mentioned, feedstock agnostic. And in general, uh, we tend to have greener solutions. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't carry a lot of weight today, um, but it does in, in certain markets. But it's important. You can't really charge a premium for green, but it's a great way to, to get market share if you have competitive products and competitive price. Uh, again, going back to some of the challenges, I wanted to highlight the, the regulatory compliance, in which is that's very extensive. And imagine putting together, you know, we didn't know much. We're not a, we're not a chemical company, but you're trying to build infrastructure in Pasadena, trying to do uh, infrastructure and in manufacturing in Texas. We had to learn everything from scratch. You know, you bring in consultants and things like that, but working with the city of Pasadena was great. They, they were very helpful. You know, we use great chemical engineers and stuff, but, you know, trying to work with the AQMD in California, it was, it was a nightmare. You know, it took us a year and lots of money um, to try and get a permit for something that was so small it doesn't even register on their, on their dials, but it's very, very tightly regulated. So this is our ca catalyst manufacturing facility in uh, East Pasadena. So we're um, just north of Colorado Boulevard on San Gabriel Boulevard. So if you know that 7-Eleven on the corner, they're just a half a block north of that. We have about half of that block. And uh, a catalyst manufacturing is done there, as well as a pretty uh, elaborate R&D facility that covers everything from uh, basic chemistry to advanced application development. And then in Texas, uh, it's a pretty nice facility on a, on a fairly large lot that we acquired from that company back in 2004. And we've expanded that several times, and we have some pretty good capacity and some, and some great people there as well. Uh, the, the resin technology, I'm not going to go too much into the, into the details of, 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 of sort of what makes it up, but the idea is it's a, it's a new type of plastic. And this plastic is uh, good in a number of different applications. It performs well. Uh, it's very corrosion resistant. It's very lightweight, makes very good composites. So you can imagine there's a lot of applications. And we're going to talk about, in particular, uh, on the energy side, but we're also looking at things in transportation. We have programs going with some of the major automotive OEMs, as well as in infrastructure and, and other applications as well. So in the energy industry, uh, it's great to be aligned with some global trends. Uh, global trends here is that oil and gas will continue to dominate the global energy supply. Um, this report was a couple years old, uh, about three years old, but looking uh, driven by the demand for, for electricity, uh, oil and gas will remain uh, uh, close to 60% of what we use for generating electricity. Um, that number will probably go up a little bit um, after the, uh, the Fukushima accident. Uh, obviously, Japan is getting away from nuclear, and Germany has also looked at getting away from nuclear, and, and we obviously know about San Onofre is not coming back online. So we have to, one, uh, the, 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 the good news is, is that there are some other technologies out there. The bad news is nuclear is one of those 
carbon zero uh, ways of generating electricity. So you have to make up for a lot uh, of that with other, with other means. Uh, natural gas and offshore development are going to lead the market with, uh, with uh, demand five times that of, uh, of oil for, for gas. Uh, that's natural gas. And then uh, offshore will represent a very large increment uh, of, new, of new things brought online over the next several decades. Renewables are still an important part of the mix, in particular wind, uh, but they'll, they'll continue to play an important role, but they're relatively small. Even with all the investments in wind and solar, it represents a very small amount of, of how we generate electricity. But it is growing at about a 7% average a year, down from about the, the mid-teens that it was before the, uh, the downturn in, in 2008-2009. Uh, one of the big areas for us is in, uh, is in horizontal drilling. It's a, it's a technology that has enabled sort of the, the natural gas and the oil revolution in the U.S. Uh, I think uh, the, the government just released this morning that uh, last year was the first year in several decades that we produced more oil than we imported uh, last year. Um, uh, North Dakota next year will be the largest oil producing state in the nation, will outstrip Texas. And in 2015, we'll be the largest oil producing country in the world. Um, that's just, that just boggles my mind. And if you look at natural gas, we're a fraction of that of the rest of the world. Uh, Japan's paying in the teens. Uh, Europe is about $10. In the U.S., it's about $3. So it's a huge opportunity for us to, uh, to take advantage of those natural resources. And companies are doing a better job of it. And uh, if you look at, at places outside the U.S., like China, um, they have actually larger natural gas reserves in the U.S. And I've read some articles that says if you want to solve uh, the CO2 problem, teach the Chinese how to frack and, and, and get, capture that gas. Uh, there's issues there, you know, they don't have the infrastructure, they don't have the water, there's a lot of, a lot of barriers, but usually with economic incentive comes, those, uh, comes solutions to those barriers. Uh, the other area is in uh, what's called offshore or subsea infrastructure. So I think if you've driven up the, the, the coastal highway, you're used to seeing a, a platform or something off, uh, off in the distance. What I never appreciated was all this stuff here, which they call the subsea village. There's an incredible amount of, it's literally almost a city that sits on the ocean floor. And uh, if you look at the Gulf of Mexico, there are tens of thousands of miles of pipelines uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. And all these wells are all connected with all this subsea infrastructure. Literally tens or hundreds of miles of pipeline that run on the ocean floor of depths of you know, up to 10,000 feet or, or more uh, in the future. So there's tremendous technology uh, challenges here. And we provide differentiated products that uh, address those, constrained, uh, those technology constrained market segments. And we have several products that are either qualified or in qualification programs with either major uh, uh, E&P companies or you know, what we call tier one service providers, you know, the Schlumberger's, Halliburton's, uh, Bakers of the world. So it's all, new materials are, are sort of a new frontier and providing materials that allow you to replace other things or go after uh, oil and gas that you can't get after with other, without these types of technology provides a great opportunity. The last area is in a, in a renewable area of energy, which is wind. Um, I'm sure some of you have driven out to the desert, and when you do, you go past the, the wind fields that are out there. You look at some of those turbines, you go, wow, those are some pretty big windmills. But if you look on average, they're actually pretty small. A lot of those turbines that are out in the desert are in the, you know, they're probably like one and a half, two megawatt units. Uh, today, state of the art is a six megawatt unit. Um, and they're prototyping now up to 10 megawatt units. So the blades you see out in the desert may be 30 meters long. They're, they're prototyping blades now at 85 meters long. Um, that's a single blade, so you can imagine the, uh, the, the, you know, the, what that turning radius is. It's, uh, it's very, very large. And uh, we used to have a, well, you can kind of see it there, you can't see it too well in this picture. But it's an A380 silhouette, and it's dwarfed by uh, an existing, you know, six megawatt turbine. You know, if you've ever seen an A380 in the wingspan of that. Um, the nice thing is this market is growing well. Uh, it's about a billion dollar opportunity for direct replacement of the resins they're using today. We offer, again, lower cost of energy by being able to manufacture faster, save money on the resin, save money on the, on the manufacturing on direct labor, and then providing a product that um, enabling longer and more durable uh, uh, blades for this industry. So several years ago, uh, Sue's Lawn was trying to grow very, very fast and they had lots of failures in the marketplace and there wasn't a week that went by in the Wall Street Journal where you saw an ad about you know, liability associated with uh, failing turbines. And so that's one of the reasons this industry is very conservative is the life cycle of these products have to be 20, 30 years and sometimes more. And you really have to understand what the material is going to do. You know, they're not going to put it in a subsea pipeline or on a windmill if you know in 10 years it might fail. So they have to have a real good idea of, of what the, the failure mechanism is and, and, and what, uh, what are the possibilities. And you can never plan on all the possibilities but you, you kind of learn as you go. We're currently qualifying uh, with two top 10 uh, OEMs uh, in the wind industry, and we'll be making a full 40-meter blade uh, later this year in, in Europe. 
with one of those partners. Um, some of the other challenges I mentioned was the, the robust IP required for a sustainable competitive advantage. And that, that's going to be uh, very well illustrated in the next example I'll give. But just kind of touch on the IP portfolio that we, we control. It's, it's Caltech's largest. And we licensed that technology back in 2001. And it represents, it's about 350 issued and pending patents, which are, which are global in nature. So it, it turns out to be about 900 cases that we manage. And the, the patents cover everything from the catalyst to the products and the methods for making them and everything in between. The good news is our leading patents don't start expiring until 2023. So we have a good decade to go. And we're always reinventing things. And our relationship with Professor Grubbs, we are licensed with Caltech. We get additional improvement rights out of, out of his lab at no additional cost. So we have a very close working relationship and it flows to us and it works very, very well. He actually just had a big breakthrough about a year ago that's enabling a whole new area of work for us in, in fine chemicals. So that work continues and, and uh, he gets the, the best and brightest people in the world to work for him. And the technology, unfortunately, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, is very well vetted. And what that means is it's been challenged a lot. We've had to fight a lot of battle, battles early on. Um, we had a, a, an a battle with a small chemical company that was infringing the technology. We didn't have the, the resources to go after it. And Caltech, for the first time in their history, actually stood up and defended their IP portfolio and spent several million dollars in getting that company eventually to, to stop doing what they were doing and getting what's called permanently enjoined from practicing the technology. Uh, we're embroiled right now in some additional litigation. Uh, we'll talk about that at the end. Um, it's kind of uh, timely for this uh, talk because the story just came out on Monday of this week. It's been going on for four years or five years, but the news doesn't always uh, follow things very well. We've used that uh, dominant position that we have from Caltech to in-license or acquire other technologies that are sort of bolt on to what we're doing today. And it's allowed us to have a, a fairly large global franchise. So if you look at the world, um, there's a lot of activity. You know, uh, I'd say anywhere from two thirds to three quarters of the economic activity are outside the United States. And so if you want to be in those areas, you have to have patent protection. Otherwise, uh, people are going to infringe or are going to basically steal your stuff and, and do it in their region. So we have a very broad portfolio. And all the major markets globally, we have covered, um, including places like South Africa and Israel, throughout Europe, Australia. Um, you know, all the major markets uh, today and what we see in the future. And this sort of gives you a list of, uh, of all the patents that we have in these different territories. This here is a huge task. It's taken us, um, you know, a decade to build, uh, millions of dollars to put together. Uh, we have in-house uh, in -house counsel that's, that, that does a fabulous job at managing this process. And it's, it's really a, a culmination of a, a, a lot of hard work and, and effort on, on a lot of people's parts. But without this type of franchise, you know, you might be able to get one area, but you're, you're going to be uh, limited and all, everything else you'll be able to do. So with that broad portfolio, we have established a, a fairly robust licensing business. And these are some of the companies that we work with today. These are all announced deals. We have about equal number that are, that are confidential that we, that we can't talk about. But they range from pharmaceuticals to specialty chemicals and materials. And then other uh, what we call capital intensive downstream or non-strategic opportunities. So there might be an opportunity that we see, but hey, it's going to take two, three hundred million dollars of dedicated capital to bring that to market, and that's not what we're going to do. So we'll look to partner or outlicense that. And one of the case studies is about an exactly is exactly one of those uh, opportunities. So our very first licensing deal, or if you will, uh, distribution agreement, was with this uh, ten billion dollar public company called Sigma Aldrich, They're the largest chemical catalog company around. And what that allowed us to do is, you know, we're this small little company in Pasadena. How are we going to get the global word out that we have this new catalyst technology? And so we did a deal with them to be able to provide research quantities to all the people in the labs around the world. Because no matter where you go in the world, there's an Aldrich catalog sitting on the shelf. And so it was ready access to the technology, um, easy use, as well as um, leveraging off of all of their you know, marketing and, and advertising as well. So we, we jointly advertised the technology. And many of our customers that eventually licensed from us, they first dabbled with the technology from, from Aldrich before they came to us for a license or a partnership. So it's worked very well. It was a 10-year agreement. We just renewed it, uh, I think, about a year ago for another 13 years. And it's brought in a lot of, a lot of cash to the company. So it's been a, a great partnership. And uh, it, it's worked very well for us. Uh, from that, uh, I wanted to go on to one of the case studies, and that's on a drug uh, that's being developed for, and is actually just recently launched, uh, to combat hepatitis C. So this is several years ago. Uh, the cover of Newsweek uh, was a big splash over, this is several years ago now, but uh, 3 million Americans were estimated to have hepatitis C. It's probably more like 10, 10 to 15. But the, one of the big issues is you don't, you don't um, 
uh, have signs of hepatitis C until up to two or three decades after you, after you have it when it starts doing serious liver damage. So there's been a big push by the World Health Organization to test and treat. So if you don't know you have it, you can spread it through the standard means of, of bodily fluids and uh, there are a lot of people come out uh, to, to say, hey, you know, it's, it's something you should test for. But it's estimated worldwide to have over 200 million people afflicted with hepatitis C. So uh, as a single, uh, single thing, second only to HIV as a, as a viral infection. Uh, standard of care is not very uh, effective. It's interferon plus uh, ribavirin. It's about almost a year treatment of this, of, this, uh, of this combination therapy. Significant side effects, poorly tolerated, less than 50% overall success rate of controlling the virus. And so it's something that causes liver damage and is a real big problem uh, on, a global, uh, on a global basis. So that's sort of um, uh, the stage, but to, to say where we started from uh, was back in, in actually 1994 at Caltech. So it was when I was a postdoc there, down the hallway, there was another postdoc that was working on, on this chemistry. And he had the idea of using Bob's chemistry to modify proteins or modify peptides to, to make proteins. And this work was published in 1995. It was, you know, it was very interesting, but nobody really thought, oh boy, this is gonna be a game changer in the world. So this got published in 1995 and, you know, we didn't think much of it, um, uh, it was very novel, but about five years later, um, it was disclosed that this uh, German uh, pharmaceutical company called Bohr Ingelheim had developed a drug that was going into phase two clinical trials using the technology for, it's called the hepatitis C protease inhibitor, and it targets one of the enzymes um, that the, the virus uses to, uh, to, to clone itself. And it's an inhibitor to that, uh, to that enzyme. And they approached us saying, hey, you know, we're, we're in phase two clinical trials, and that's usually the first time they have to disclose how the drug is made. And so that's how we knew what they were doing. And they, they worked with us for a couple of years in, in catalyst supply. We, you know, we were pretty excited. This is back in, in 2000, 2001. You know, we were getting purchase orders for hundreds of thousands of dollars or a million dollars in catalyst. And a million dollars of catalyst is, you know, it might fit in a, in a, in a five-gallon jug. So it's not a lot of material. It's a, a, a very costly material. So we're very excited about it. But we're also very young and very, and very ignorant about the drug industry. And, and about a year and a half uh, into their phase two clinical trial, they dropped out of clinical trials. It had some cardiac toxicity, and they didn't want to go into phase three, which is typically at least a $100 million uh, uh, minimum investment to go to phase three. Now, what was interesting in what the drug industry does uh, very often is somebody shows the path and then everybody else jumps onto it. And so if you, and this is, a, I said the pictures uh, really help here. So if you look at it, it's kind of a ring with this other stuff hanging off it. And this is what BIPI developed and, and, and showed in 2000. So over the next several years, every major pharmaceutical company in the world was developing their own version of this to test for hep C uh, uh, efficacy. And so BMS, Merck, Pfizer, all these guys were doing it. And all of them either didn't make it through clinical trials or, or, um, or dropped out early until very recently, um, a J Johnson & Johnson had a, had a development candidate as well, and that drug uh, made it through clinical trials all the way to phase three and actually just launched uh, three weeks ago in Japan. So this is the first drug uh, that's in the market today, commercial drug using our technology, and again, this is an 18-year journey from the first scientific publication about what's possible to all those drugs going through development and clinical trials to Janssen or J&J, &J, going through clinical trials and then launching it. So it was launched in Japan three weeks ago. Um, it'll be launched in the US and Europe sometime next year. And we're very excited, obviously, about this as being the first commercial drug using our technology. There are several other drugs now that are, that are in phase one and, and, and preclinical development. But we've seen at least five or six drugs drop out of clinical trials uh, because of various issues. And one of the big changing landscapes is the pharmaceutical industry. They've developed so many different drugs for different, for different uh, uh, ailments that there's a very high bar for developing new things. The FDA is very, very conservative, and you have to have very compelling data to allow you to go to either late stage uh, development in phase three or to launch. And a lot of drugs don't make it. And the liability is very high, especially in the US. You know, cases like Vioxx really hurt Merck. And there are a lot of other things out there that people, uh, you know, take on a lot of liability for. So, um, you know, we thought early on this was going to be a big area for us. Um, even though we've made many millions of dollars over the years in selling Catalyst, it really never resulted in a, in a, in a drug being launched and then us having that recurring revenue on an ongoing basis through a commercial, uh, commercial drug. So this is an area where both long timelines, as I mentioned, you know, uh, almost 18 years, as well as regulatory compliance uh, is very, very challenging. Now the good news here from a, from, a, from a development point of view from a company, we didn't spend any money on this. 
Right? They paid us for Catalyst, and if it was a, a different Catalyst, they paid us to develop it. So there was, no, there was no real downside for us. It was just lack of upside if things dropped out of trials. So it's sort of one of those things, that it's like buying a lot of lottery tickets, and every once in a while you get a, you get a, meet, you know, you get a, a $10 ticket or a $20 ticket, and every once in a while you, you might get a, a pretty good size uh, a win here. And so we're very excited about it, and we think this is going to obviously continue uh, with, other, with other drugs that are out there. Sorry, I'm going backwards. There we go. Okay. Um, so the next case study I wanted to talk about was um, the ability to convert renewable feedstocks into chemicals and materials. So up until, uh, I'd say, the past uh, couple of decades, almost all of the, the, the things that are out there, from clothing to you know, paints and coatings and you, you name it, uh, all came from petrochemical feedstocks. So this is non-renewable feedstock. Eventually, they will run out. There's a lot of debate on when that time will be, but they're, they're finite. The idea being is, can you do the same thing with renewable feedstocks and replace these feedstocks with similar or better products? And there's been a lot of activity out there uh, looking at that. So in, in 2002, uh, one of our advisors was working for, for Cargill at the time, and he said, you know, I was in a meeting there, and they're looking at increasing their activity in their industrial bioproducts group. You should probably come up there and come up there to Minneapolis and give them a talk about what your technology could do, because they might be very interested. So they were very interested from day one. Uh, they're, they're a great company. They're, they're a private company, which allows them to do things. And that's one of the other big issues with the chemical industry, is almost every player is public. And so they're really beholden to Wall Street when it comes to you know, their return on their investment and things like that. That really limits the chemical industry in a lot of ways because a lot of these activities, they're decade-long processes. And if you can't show a return on investment in a much shorter time frame, it's hard to fund those projects. And one of the things you know, I had the, in negotiating the deal with them and later on, I mean, the, the, the president of Cargill came in the room and said, how are things going? I mean, you know, it's a $70 billion company at the time, and you got a president coming and asking about how the employees are doing, how's the project going, but they have a vested interest in what they're doing, and they have a very long-term uh, horizon. They'll invest, you know, a decade out because they think things are going to be important. So it was great to work with them. And so the idea was, can we take things like soybean oil and other things and use our, sorry, use our catalyst to convert them to a variety of value-added products? And so uh, we started that work formally in 2003, and then at the time, the DOE was funding these types of renewable projects. So Materia and Caltech and Cargill uh, applied for a grant. It was almost $4 million that we got from the DOE spread over a couple of years that really helped bring the platform forward. Um, uh, Cargill was really looking at one or two products. It actually turned out to be an entire platform of products. And they're not a, car they're not a chemical company. You know, they're a food, agriculture, and risk management company. And they said, look, we're not really set up to handle a, a platform technology like this what do you think we should do? And we got together over a course of a weekend and said, you know, um, we think this is great, you think this is great, but there's no better test in the market. So why don't we form a joint venture on paper, a 50-50 joint venture, and go out to the marketplace and see if we can get this thing funded. And uh, we had a number of investors clamoring to get at the deal. And in 2007, uh, November 2007, we closed, first round of financing for the deal was $45 million from TPG. And that's a big number because the, the, and one of the reasons we looked at this partnership is that we knew it was going to take hundreds of millions of dollars to bring this to market. And there was no way in our business model we could justify that type of investment. And so over the course of several investments, uh, TPG invested here, um, uh, Total and, and Naxos invested another $100 million uh, in 2010, existing investors another $50 million here, and then last summer, a year ago last summer, another round of another $100 million. So over $300 million over uh, since November 2007 has gone into the commercialization of this technology in addition to the 20 million that Cargill put into it, the 5 million that DOE put into it. So there's been a lot of dollars gone into this in a lot of time. But now uh, they just reopened uh, the world's largest biorefinery based on our technology. And so as I mentioned, this started out as a, as a joint venture uh, between, Materia and Cal, uh, between uh, Materia and Cargill. And everything I'm going to talk about today uh, is all disclosed in their S1. And so if you guys want to find out more about it, uh, you can go on, online and get that. But this is the, the last S1 they filed was March of 2012. And uh, there's a lot of detail in there. But um, it involves a number of different uh, product applications. In addition, uh, because, of the, uh, because of the joint venture nature, we still have a significant amount of equity left in the company. And although that's worth more today because of the last round of financing, this has at least been disclosed in their S1. So we have a chunk of equity that at some point will be a, a nice uh, non-dilutive financing for, for our company. 
The company itself is looking at initially petroleum substitutes and then going into pre what's called premium alternatives and specialty chemicals. And they're looking at large markets like consumer ingredients. Um, they actually had a press release, I think, this morning or yesterday about some of the personal care products they're launching. Uh, there are commercial products out there today that are using renewable products instead of petroleum-based products for personal care. Um, and they have a number of different applications, whether it's lubricants, personal care products, uh, intermediate chemicals, engineering polymers. And this is an example of uh, multiple adoptions. So they're not selling to the end. So we're selling to them. They're making a product. They're selling that intermediate to a company who's then making a product, who's selling that chemical to, let's say, an ingredient maker like Dow Corning, who's then selling that to maybe a Lancome, who's then formulating that into a personal care product. So there might be five stops along the way to get to market. And there's a lot of, a lot of adoption risk there. Um, but uh, over the course of the past couple years, uh, they've been working very hard and they brought on this uh, biorefinery in Indonesia. Um, they're working with a company called Wilmar, which is sort of the ADM uh, and the Cargill of Southeast Asia. They're the largest agricultural company down there. And they operate a lot of uh, palm plantations. And they were able to, for a relatively low cost, um, several tens of millions of dollars, be able to put a, a metathesis module in this large multi-billion dollar uh, complex. And this is the dedicated module using our technology. And it's a 400 million pound per year plant, which is a world scale uh, chemical plant, to turn, in this case, palm oil into uh, various products. And this came online in July of this year with first commercial uh, shipments uh, occurring probably a couple weeks later. Their second plant is uh, in the works. They acquired a, uh, a, a distressed biodiesel asset in Mississippi, uh, Delta Biofuels. They bought that in 2011. They had a press release uh, a few weeks ago indicating that would be online in, in 2016. So even though they bought a facility and they're retrofitting it, it's still gonna take five years. If this was a green field and they had to do everything from scratch, including all the regulatory and permitting, it probably would have been 10 to 15 years. And so it's a, it can be a very, very long time to market. So that's one of the recurring themes of the chemical industry is nobody wants a chemical company in their backyard, especially at scale. So you have to go through a lengthy process of, of, uh, of all the permitting and regulatory uh, compliance there. And they're able to shortcut that by buying an existing asset, but it's still taken them five years to come online with a, a lot of invested capital. So this sort of highlights uh, everything there, right? Uh, capital intensive business, conservative uh, industry, uh, numerous established global players, they're gonna be competing with the BASFs of the world and the Dow Chemicals of the world. There's multiple adoption risk, long timelines for product commercialization. Uh, we gave them a fully baked process in, in 2007, and there, six years later, the plant is online and running. So it, it takes a long time. Uh, regulatory compliance can be, can be very challenging. And again, the only ability uh, for them to maintain their position is they're leaning on our robust IP portfolio as well as they've developed their own for all the downstream products. Otherwise, you'd see a plant like this showing up in China in, you know, in two years and just running away and nothing you could do about it. So it's a, it's a, it's a big challenge out there. Uh, one of the issues on, on IP, as I mentioned, uh, we've been involved in this litigation for a while, and this was the story that hit uh, Monday morning. So this week has been a challenging set of mornings. Every morning I get up and I look at my email and go, oh boy, that's, that's pretty good. So this was uh, Monday morning in Chemical Engineering News. This is sort of the, uh, the, the trade magazine for, for chemists and engineers. And this is a full page story, you know, uh, patent fight, uh, Nobel Prize winning technology at the center of this messy infringement case. So we've been, we've been, we've been battling this uh, since probably 2010. Uh, and it's been ongoing, and it's, it's very, very challenging. You know, there are lulls in the action. Uh, it took the court over two and a half, almost two and a half years to make a ruling on something that should have taken a month. Um, it was kind of good for us because we had no legal bills for two and a half years, but at the same time, everything's in limbo. Um, the good news is, if you read the article, is at the end of it, it says, uh, in the meantime, uh, while the case is being heard in the US, uh, we had the same patents that we had a fight over in Europe, and we opposed those, and we got them completely revoked. And so they only have, so you saw our global patent estate, they have two patents in the US, and then they have one patent in Japan and one patent in Israel, and that's it. And we have you know, over 80 in the US and then hundreds uh, elsewhere. So you know, we're, it'll hopefully play out over the next 18 to 24 months, but it is an ongoing challenge. You, know, you have to manage this legal process, it's distractionary, there's lots of issues associated with it, you know, customers are concerned, it's something you have to work through, but it's a reality if you wanna work in the chemical industry. 
pretty much anywhere where you're you know, providing hardware technology. So if you look at Apple fighting Samsung, you look at uh, you know, Qualcomm, huge intellectual property portfolios that people pay a lot of money for. You know, Google bought Motorola mostly for the IP portfolio worth billions of dollars. And that's because you can block huge areas uh, of, of product if, if you have that type of portfolio. And uh, it'll continue to be a challenge for us, but we're, we're very well prepared for it. And even though we're a small company, you know, fighting a, I think it's a $50 billion chemical company today, we still feel pretty good about where we're going to come out. Obviously, there's been a tremendous amount of uh, effort uh, put in by a number, a lot of people. Uh, I wish I could show everybody that's involved, but uh, some of the notable characters are up here. Uh, great place to be in Pasadena here. We've been able to attract some incredible talent. Uh, Stephen Wright worked for another company right down the street here in Monrovia, AeroVironment. He was their CFO when they went public in 2007. Uh, he's now our chief operating officer. Uh, Mark Trimmer was a Caltech PhD, worked in industry for about 10 years before joining us. Uh, Todd DeHare is our VP of Strategy and Finance. Uh, he was an investment banker. We relocated him from London uh, to Pasadena about a year and a half ago. Chris Cruz is the other co-founder of the company, and, and he's done a lot of work in, uh, in, in plastics area, which is an area that he, that he specializes in today. Uh, John Kibler is our VP of Business Development and worked with a number of platform technology companies in the past. And then Dick Peterson um, is an entrepreneur, but also uh, has pioneered a lot of the work on the renewable side. So he came to join us in 2000 looking at an area of renewable feedstock conversion and we were talking green back in the days when nobody cared about green. You know, we went to chemical companies when oil was $20 a barrel, and they were very quick to show us the door. It wasn't until we talked to Cargill that they really picked up on it and wanted to move forward. Um, but there's been great work done by uh, a number of other people, and it's been, a, it's been a great pleasure working with everybody. And then lastly, wanted to have a special recognition for Professor Grubbs and Caltech. As I mentioned, without, without either of them, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, Professor Grubbs has been an incredible, not only a technical mentor, but sort of a life mentor. You know, being as prolific as he is and a Nobel laureate, he still finds all the time to be able to, you know, uh, be with his kids and, and do lots of, lots of cool stuff. I actually worried when I first came to Caltech that he was going to fire me because whenever he came into the lab, he never talked about what I was doing. He was always talking about his kid playing water polo or something like that. I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get axed here. And it was just that, you know, he said the technology will come along. You know, don't worry about that. Really focus on your work and, and it'll happen. But I was lucky enough, he invited me to spend the week with him in Stockholm at the, at the Nobel ceremony in, in 2005. And it was a, you know, once in a lifetime opportunity. And as I mentioned, Caltech, the Office of Tech Transfer, uh, Tech Transfer has been incredibly supportive from day one. Um, they've been very helpful in structuring the, our license to them, uh, being very flexible on the litigation side and, and dealing with costs. So it's been a, a great partnership, and we hope that someday Caltech's equity stake will be worth a lot. And if I'm, if I'm lucky enough, I'll be able to be a, you know, a donor there at some point. So, um, you know, we'll see. But it, uh, it's, been a, it's been a great, uh, you know, how long has it been? I guess a little over 15 years now. Um, so it's, uh, it's been a, a pretty, long, pretty long journey, but so far it's, it's been, I'd say, it seems like it's gone by in a day, but it's, uh, it's been 15 and a half years. And that's it. So. If you take the helicopter perspective, what do you think are the big ideas in, in the chemical industry right now? I mean, from your presentation, we can gather that, of course, there's a lot happening in renewables and, and the move from fossil fuels to, to other sources. Mm -hmm. uh, but do you have any particular ones that, that, that you think are... Well, I'd say there, there are islands uh, of, of intense activity. So uh, around feedstock is a, is a big issue. Um, you know, feedstock has been turned on its head over the past, let's say, seven years with all the natural gas in the U.S. So natural gas used to be essentially the best place to put all your assets was in the Middle East because natural gas was almost free, you know, to them. Um, now we're in the same par as, uh, we're, we can produce ethylene and polyethylene at the same price they can in the Middle East. If, you, if somebody said that six, seven years ago, you'd have been locked up. So the changing feedstocks, which is something the chemical industry doesn't like or isn't and, used and to. And by feedstock, just so everyone is on the same page, you mean the material that you create plastics from. Or exactly. The and so feedstock yeah. is basically oil and gas. Yeah. I mean, that's where, and, and things like salt. I mean, the, all the basic, basic chemicals. Um, but that feedstock mix has changed a lot. And that's a, that's a big area for the industry to change to. And then I'd say the pharmaceutical industry, they're going through a lot of changes, um, just challenging you know, how do you, how do you produce drugs and how do you, how do you pay for it? I mean, one of the things nobody ever talked about in the, you know, in the, in the healthcare cost uh, discussion was that socialized medicine works really well as long as you have one big player that's not socialized, and that'd be the U.S. I mean, in a way, we were subsidizing the rest of the world's healthcare because we would pay the most for drugs. 
If you go to a lot of other places, they're, they're, they're half or a third the price. And so if everybody pays at a, if you remember, I think it was uh, Clinton's first administration when he talked about limiting pharmaceutical companies' profits, they all dropped you know, 20, 30% in a very short period of time. Because they have to put 800, 900, a billion dollars at risk for something that might never come to market. And they have to recover all those development costs. And so the pharmaceutical companies are in you know, very challenging positions to grow. I think Merck just had an announcement a couple weeks ago they're going to lay off another 20% of their workforce over the next uh, year and a half. Um, regulatory is a big issue. Uh, it becomes increasingly challenging to bring things to market. In Europe, there's a thing called REACH, which is a kind of a new regulatory environment. And it's very, very challenging. Even the big companies don't know how to interpret it and understand it. So trying to ship product to Europe is very, very challenging. You have to have a, a sheet of paper that describes your stuff in every language, in every, you know, if it's going to go around Europe, it has to be translated into every language that, that's going to go into a country. Um, you have to have, I mean, there's just lots of regulatory. Um, you have to deal with, uh, you know, countries that don't necessarily respect intellectual property. Uh, China, as it grows, it can be a very challenging uh, area to work in. Um, India is also uh, a big area to work in that can be very challenging because of that. So I'd say there's, there's regulatory, there's changing feedstocks, there's different business models that the industry is just trying to get their arms around. And then at the same time, they're sort of at the limits of existing technologies and they're trying to innovate, but there's a lack of that, uh, of that DNA within their, within their companies to do so. But so do you have any particular example, if you take a helicopter perspective, you know, and, and go beyond materia, is there any particular area that is being, you know, we're seeing disruption on the level of, you know, the internet uh, to traditional it's media? Never that, it's never that obvious. You know, it, 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 you know it, it's going to be in the clothes that you wear. You know, you're going to see smart clothing is becoming a very big thing. You know, so it, it basically will keep you warm when it's cold outside and keep you cool when it's, when it's hot outside. Um, you'll see that in, in, um, in, in fabric care. You'll see it, you know, one of the big programs we're working on with a major company is um, a, a greener uh, detergent. So 80% of the energy that's used in washing clothes is heating the water. So if you can get a detergent to have cold water detergency that's just as effective when it's in warm water, that's 80% of the energy savings. I mean, it's a, that's a game changer, right? That's huge. Not only you save water, but you save a lot of energy. So those types of things that are out there, but the consumer generally doesn't, doesn't see that they, because it's always the products that you, that you have that you really don't appreciate where they come from. Mm. All right, let's go to questions. In the back, and, and we're shooting this too, so we have uh, Alex here with a microphone, so please wait until he arrives. So he could you arrived. explain uh, why you decided to have a chemical company rather than uh, licensing that to BASF or Dow? That would be, like that seems much easier, right? So you mean form the company and then just license it off, or why did... Or actually create products, is that the question? Or no, like, or just form the company and after a few years, just after you show that it works, just license all the patents and everything that you have to a very big player. You could, but you're typically not going to get the value for it. Um, the chemical industry typically, um, if you look at, like, acquisitions is a good way to look at value. They don't pay a big premium um, because if you're not at scale and you're not doing something and it's not, you know, it, it doesn't fit into what they're doing, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't make sense for them to acquire it. They very rarely acquire platform technology companies. They might acquire, you know, a, a, an element of it for, as a, as a, as a bolt-on, but they typically don't acquire platforms. And if they do, they usually kill them or will take a little bit of it and then flush the rest of it or, you know, spin it off or, you know, things like that. It's not a, it's not a model the chemical industry is used to because everything in the chemical industry is about scale. So if you had a big operation, they can handle that. But if you're just, it's all about intellectual property, they don't have a good mechanism for turning that into, you know, into uh, revenue for them. Question up here in the front. And just one other thing. When you say prove it out, you have to prove it out at a large scale. And so Elevon's coming online, you know, just, just in July with a 400 million pound plant. That's proving it at scale. Proving it making a million pounds or something, eh, that's not. If you want to make a billion pounds, that kind of demonstrates because they want to see the economics at scale, not at you know a small amount of something. So it's pretty challenging. How how has your business uh, handled uh, not handled, but how has it done from a revenue standpoint over the years from 2002, 3, 4, all the way to 2013? 
have, have these patents and the licensing and the, now the productization, mm -hmm. has that resulted in a steady increase in revenue and profitability or not? And what are the numbers? I would say definitely not steady. I mean, it's very choppy, you know, um, especially early on. Uh, with, a, with a drug company going into clinical trials, you might sell a million dollars worth of catalyst and then not talk to them again for a year or 18 months. And so you can have very lumpy revenue. And so over time, as you build that base of, base of customers, it kind of smooths out a little bit, but it still goes through a lot of gyrations. We've had, so this year we're about 56, uh, fit between 50 and 60% growth over last year. And that was a little, almost uh, uh, about 40% the year before. So. Revenues have been growing nicely. Uh, we're, we're not profitable yet. Uh, we don't anticipate that probably till next year or the year after, but that isn't really the goal. The goal was really to, to build the business. Um, we, you have to be careful of how much you burn, but do it in a way that you can at least uh, you know, raise the financing to get to the next milestone. So there are a lot of companies, if you look at biotech, for instance, they might be acquired for a billion dollars and have no revenue, but their drug pipeline, you know, they have two drugs in phase two clinical trials and one in phase one clinical trials and three preclinical pre development candidates, and they might be acquired for a billion dollars because the industry knows what that, what that funnel will look like in, in five years through, you know, normal attrition rates, and so they can put a value on that. Um, it's always something you look for, but we, 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 our model is if, if we were to be acquired, it would probably be in multiple pieces, so we offer multiple opportunities, because no company would appreciate everything that we do, so you'd be able to, we've constructed it such that you could acquire different parts of it if you wanted. Um, it just depends on, you know, who the acquirer would be. What does the breakdown look like in terms of percentages of the different revenue streams? Like, you don't have to... It's about 50-50 yeah. this year. About 50% on the catalyst, uh, making and selling catalyst and licensing it, and then 50% on the product side. Okay. And the product side just started, you know, maybe two years ago, two and a half years ago. And which one has the highest profit margins? Oh, catalysts are always the highest margins. Okay. Um, catalyst, catalyst typically, a bad catalyst might be 50% gross margin, a good catalyst might be 95% gross margin. Oh, wow. Back here? Yeah. Uh, hi, you, you hit upon the, uh, the sensitivity of a high-tech startup, which is adoption. And how do you drive adoption in a very adoption-resistant industry such as chemicals? What's within your control? I wouldn't say you can really drive it. Um, you can push. Uh, one of the things that we do, uh, and, it is in, and we had to be very clear with our investors, we have what's called our industrial collaborations program, which is sponsored research by, by the company to you know, develop a process or optimize a process or a product for them. And so even though it provides us good revenue, because we charge a lot for our, for our PhDs, it's really not for revenue's sake. It's one of the only ways that we've been able to find that we can affect that third-party attrition rate in product development. So, so many times a product is about to go this way, and if you're actively involved with that company and that product, you can kind of steer it in the right direction. You, if, it, if it's going to die, it's going to die. But a lot of times things die for the wrong reasons. You know, it's not because of the, the viability of the product or... The other thing I didn't mention about the chemical industry is that if a product takes seven years to come to market, there's a, you're going to have a recession, you're going to have a change in management in that seven-year period. And so if you don't work closely with a company and your, cha and your champion gets moved someplace else, the new person might, might want to take on the risk and just kill it. You know, be the first thing a new person does is clean house with all these, these projects that are going on. We don't know what these are. They're not generating revenue. Let's get rid of them. So having a close working relationship with a company that you're either licensing or co-developing with is really, really important. It's probably the only way you can sort of drive that, that, uh, that commercialization. Here. Is there a company you model yourself after that you say, we're a new, like a new Amazon or such, uh, to use the internet? Um, there was a company many years ago uh, called Catalytica that sort of tried this as well. But when they started, it was a great idea. Let's develop catalysts. We started with the catalysts are already developed, and now you've got to find applications for them. They never were able to make it. I mean, they went into contract manufacturing, eventually got acquired. But there's really no other good example out there. I mean, all the examples, yeah, I'll give you an example. 100 years ago, you know, uh, whether it was Dow or BSF or, or Monsanto or DuPont, that's how they started. You know, um, but today, you don't really see, quote unquote, chemical companies just growing from nothing. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty challenging. Uh, I'd rather be a more profitable and faster growing version of that, but yes. So, and the chemical industry's changed, right? I mean, it was all about at large assets, right? It, and, and it was just, hey, we got billions of dollars here, you can't, you can't compete in our industry. And then the Chinese came around and said, 
well, I can write a check for $4 billion, and it'll clear. So I'm going to get in the PVC business, and I'll undersell you by 20%, and there's nothing you can do about it. So it used to be your asset base would protect you from, you know, from other entrants, but that's not the issue today. There's tons of capital out there. I mean, there's more money than you can imagine in the Middle East and the Far East looking to put to work to, to do things. So it's not really about asset management. It's more about innovation, competitive advantage, and really differentiating products that can show performance advantages or cost advantages, or preferably both. Everybody wants it cheaper and better at the same time. A follow-up on that. So, so how do you raise money for a chemical company? Because it seems a little different from other startups. I mean, it seems like from, from your presentation, too, that some of these companies, when they're at the startup basis, get grants, for example, mm -hmm. to take something to a certain stage. And, and so how, can you walk us through just quickly how that works? I mean, it's been when, very when challenging. When you get to a we, we have tried to work with uh, classic VCs and have never been able to come to terms. Uh, so we've worked with um, you know, strategic investors, family offices, so we've taken no institutional money to date. And between debt and equity, we've raised probably close to $90 million uh, since inception. Um, and and uh, there's a whole story around Aldrich. Um, the founder of Aldrich, Alfred Bader, um, Aldrich is a $10 billion company, still the single largest shareholder. He saw one of our ads. So first of all, he was the CEO, and then he retired, but he's still the largest single shareholder, so they kept, him, they kept him in the loop on things. He heard that they did this deal with this company in California, and that they paid us a million dollars, so we asked for a million dollars to, to have them market our product. And they said, why would we pay you to do that? People want to pay us to market the product. I said, I'll guarantee you the revenue, and I'll put it in the, put it in the deal that if you don't get such a revenue, you can, you'll get a refund and we exceeded the revenue day one, because we knew the pent-up demand was out there. But he heard of this and he said, we gotta, we gotta talk to these guys. He invited me up to his office in Wisconsin, and I didn't even start talking about the, about the company. He said, I want to invest. And it was initial half million dollar investment, and his family office now is about $30 million in. Wow. But he grew the company over 30 years before it became a real big success. I mean, it was a small little company, you know, that just grew and grew and grew and then eventually, you know, went public and grew more. And uh, there's not too many overnight successes in the, in the sort of the hard sciences. So it's sciences. Non, mostly non-traditional forms of? It's all, well, I, would, I wouldn't say family office is non-traditional and strategics. I think one of the, the text marks here, we, they talked about one of the, I think it was a interocular uh, device company. They said they took no money from uh, institutional investors. It was all strategics. Uh, just for that reason. They don't quite get the business model in the sense that how much it's, you know, they want reasonably, reasonably quick exits, and you can't promise that. I mean, it's yeah. just not possible. So we've got some other questions back here, but I thought I might be able to ask one first. You've talked, and first of all, it's amazing how far you've come in 18 years. Uh, absolutely amazing. Oh, thanks. You're here in Pasadena. <laughs> uh, but I, I wonder if you might take us back to the beginnings. You know, you're working at Caltech with Professor Grubbs. You understand that you've hit upon something that may be valuable to the rest of the world, but how do you determine you know, I'm going to go out and start a company or I'm going to commercialize this technology. Where does that catalyst uh, sort of begin uh, in that process? I mean, I've always been an entrepreneur. I didn't know it, but I always have been. And, um, you know, uh, Bob, was, Bob was such a great guy to work for uh, and, and, and he helped in so many ways that, as, as I think in the introduction, it mentioned that I was a visiting associate. So I had a, I had a day job working for another startup, uh, you know, 40, 50 hours a week. Um, but I used to work at Caltech at night and on the weekends. And part of that was just because he had, when he, when he published uh, information on this catalyst, everybody wanted it. And they would call him up and say, hey, can we get some? And it used to take a lot to make a little bit. And so I had my own little facility at Caltech and we got a little grant that they have on, on campus um, to commercialize technology. And that was my sort of my night work and my weekend work was making Catalyst and, and, and helping these companies. And it just, everybody we talked to, they were all so enamored with the technology. They said, this is the first new thing in decades and it's gonna really change the world. And so you hear that and you get pretty excited. And so the first opportunity um, to do this, which came about in, in uh, 1990, 97, 98, you know, I, I jumped at it. And you started with uh, the licensing component and, and obviously moved into your own products. Right. Is that sort of a natural step of the evolution of, okay, we're onto something, there's natural demand pent up, but can we move it to a sort of a broader application of things, or how, or how does that work as well? Well, well because, because catalysts have such a high gross margin, it was a way to bootstrap our business, right? The licensing provided you nice upfront fees and then milestone payments, and the catalyst, if you're selling a product at 89% gross margin, it really helps pay the bills. 
And so it really, you know, the old business model like 3M, their old business model was make a little, sell a little, make a little more, sell a little more. That doesn't happen too much in industry anymore. You know, they'll work up to a launch and if they don't kill it, they'll, you know, and, and do what they say they're gonna do, they'll get out of the business pretty quick. So you see chemical industries entering and exiting businesses and they don't mind flushing, you know, hey, it, it's on capital, it's $200 million, oh well, move on and do something else. So we definitely bootstrapped it from the beginning and it's just good that we didn't know what we didn't know. Otherwise, we probably never would have done it. A question here. Hi, you mentioned about uh, IP and how important IP is and that you're involved in uh, a number of IP litigations currently. How does that affect uh, your products and um, like how does it affect you uh, avoiding uh, potential IP litigations with your products? Sure. It's hard to avoid it. Um, we keep very good track of what's going on out there on a global basis. Um, but you have to have workarounds, you know. Um, so if you look at somebody's, I mean, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. has just changed the patent laws recently, so they're becoming quote more like more like Europe. But the USPTO did not do a very good job at uh, it, it. It really sort of the whole patent process. A lot of things got patented that probably shouldn't have. And you know, a patent's only as good as is a challenge. And so people get really excited, like I got a patent. Well, it doesn't mean anything unless it stands up to scrutiny. And and if a company is willing to put five, ten, twenty million dollars at challenging your patent, it's gonna it's gonna take a it's gonna take a beating. And so you have to have strategies, you know. And there's a we have, like I said, we have dedicated resources internally that look at strategies, global patent strategies, you know. And 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 patents aren't prosecuted the same way around the world. They're very different in in China. The laws changed in India where you couldn't patent a, a composition. Now you can. Uh, other parts of the world there are no patents. I mean, it's a very complex uh, you know landscape, and you just have to you know, trial and error to some extent, and then get great counsel and great people working on it that live and breathe it every day. So having done this now, what do you think are the main challenges from taking a chemical, you know, or something done in the lab and commercialize it and put it out in the free market? I mean, I think, uh, you know, Timing, timing is everything. Um, you have to be in the right cycle uh, for things. Uh, you, if you're too early, uh, you might not get in. If you're too late, you're already shut out. So timing is important. I think focus is important. Uh, surrounding yourself with the, with the right people from industry. So we have a commercial advisory board that are great people. You know, executives, ex-executives from Dow, CEOs from, you know, from, from, from Union Carbide, things like that, that, that advise us on things. But you really have to understand the trends. You really have to understand what you're doing and be very realistic. Um, when people say that's gonna take five years, don't just blow them off. You know, why is it gonna take five years? Well, this is my, oh, okay, is it, what, what could we do to change that? Well, if you do a really good job, maybe it'll be four years. Okay, so you have to set that in expectation that this is gonna take that. And if you can't find people that'll fund that, it's don't go down that path. You know, I mean, tough, tell the toughest truths first about what the reality is of where you are. And at the same time, uh, you know, be passionate about the things you're going after, but also be pragmatic about, you know, if it's too early, you know, you're, you're not going to get anywhere. And, and, and if you don't have the right partners, I mean, partnerships are incredibly important because you can't do all the work yourself. So having the right partners, having the right, I mean, I'd say this for any company, though. Having the right partners, having the right investors, having the right board, those are key to success. You have to have all those things at the same time. But going back to the gentleman's question, uh, so, you, you don't put intellectual property and litigation and, and those things as one of the main challenges for, for commercializing. But that's like products. a given. It's sort of like just cash flow. Um, and that's where partnerships help because they will, uh, they will help fight battles for you. Um, if you have a big partner with you, they won't pick on you. I mean, we, we licensed many other billion dollar companies. They didn't sue any of them. They only came after us. Why? Because we're this little company and they could beat us up. And so we've stood up to them and we, we won't back down from it and we've put up a real good fight. But you know, the other companies that are out there that they work with, they wouldn't go near them because that would really hurt their business. So and unless they really have a, a, a really super compelling business reason, they won't fight, two big companies typically won't fight. The fights are big company and small company. There's another Caltech startup, uh, Jivo, it's a public company. Uh, they're being, they've been in, embroiled in litigation with DuPont for years, uh, several years now. DuPont strategically, they filed their litigation or their lawsuit while they're on the road show for their IPO to try and you know to try and kill them, and they were able to get out into the public markets. They're fighting it, but you know fighting Dupont in Delaware court is not an easy thing. 
So you've, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, you've uh, talked about so many different areas where uh, your product is enabling innovation and, and so on. So at a personal level, are there a couple of applications that you see that personally you're excited, you hope that they'll come to fruition and, and you know, they, just, they get you excited about your product enabling? I'd say obviously the therapeutic area is an area that's of strong interest, you know, um, and there's really a lot of exciting things going on on the drug side of things, especially with these, these peptides uh, type work. They're, they're sort of going after a lot of things that are really challenging, you know, cancers and things like that that can be very, very difficult to treat, so that's pretty exciting. Um, on the energy side, very excited about wind. Um, I mean, it's a real, sh I mean, it's, I don't even want, what's worse than shame? Uh, in the U.S., we don't generate one watt of energy in offshore, uh, in offshore wind. If you look everywhere else in the world, incredible amounts of energy are being uh, generated through offshore wind. We don't generate anything here in the U.S. I think the first auction was successful over the summer off the coast of New England, and the, farm, the first windmills will be deployed probably in night 2016. But we have some of the best wind in offshore in the world in the offshore. If you, it, there's been studies shown if you put enough turbines offshore on the East Coast and a few here and there, that's enough electricity generation for almost the entire country. I mean, it's a, there's a, there's a, there's a real uh, opportunity there to really make a difference. So that's pretty exciting. Mike, Mike, I've had the fortune of being either peripherally or directly involved with Materia for 14 years. Um, and I've watched you make what seem like very nimble changes from initial sports equipment and, and the polymer and then to the catalyst and now the polymer's coming back around to maybe be the big player. Mm -hmm. um, how do you make those decisions? I mean, those, are, those seem really tough to change. They are. Um, you know, you have to be somewhat opportunistic in, in, in this type of business and go where the, go where the action is. Um, you know, in, in 2005, 2006, and really 2007, we couldn't go wrong in oil and gas. Everybody we talked to wanted to work with us, and we, we didn't have a bad meeting ever. And then in, by the end of 2008, nobody would talk to us. You know, oil went from $140 a barrel to $35 a barrel in, in what, six months. I mean, the whole industry was turned on its head. We had all these programs in oil and gas that just stopped. I mean, you have to react to that. You have to, you have to make changes. I mean, that's one of the advantages that we have versus some of the bigger chemical companies that you can be nimble. Um, whether it's because of IP challenges, uh, whether it's because of changing market conditions that are, you know, we've only had two restructurings in the, in the company's history and both of them um, were, you know, we had a board meeting, believe it or not, on 9-11 and uh, we, we had a restructuring in, in, in 2009 because of the, the downturn. And it was really, really painful. Um, but there were macro factors that, we, that were well beyond our control that you could never plan for, and you just have to face the reality that if you're gonna keep the patient alive, they're gonna have to lose a leg or lose a limb, and there's nothing you can do about it. So being nimble and being able to react to those perturbations is, is very, very important. And that's why some companies, you know, BP, you know, they had a culture that was lacking in the safety, and it just, you know, if you do yourself a favor, go onto Wikipedia and read the little timeline of BP Deepwater Horizon. They had executives on that platform that morning celebrating the victory and the movement of that platform because it was 21 days late, which was going to cost them, you know, I think it was like $45 million they were in the hole because that platform needed to get moved. And they were excited that morning. They were having a party, and that night it blew up and did what it did, you know. Um, but they had an entrenched culture of, of, of not being, you know, the, the, the safest in the world, and it, and it bit them, right? So those entrenched things can, can hurt you, and hopefully being a, a smaller company and being more nimble, you can make changes that, that don't take you know, five years or 10 years or 20 years to make. I just want to make sure that nobody got the impression that Materia isn't safe. I, I've never worked at a place that was so concerned about doing it the right way, doing it safely, doing it well, and it seems to translate into some sort of efficiency somewhere along. Most, you know, with most things, um, being not, not being safe, not being compliant, not, it, it's all good for the short term, right? But it's not a sustainable thing. You're going to have something that happens that's going to come back to bite you. And so we've found that, um, you know, so when chemical engineers, when we did our study in Pasadena, they said, you do this, this, and this, and this, and you're compliant. I said, I don't care if I'm compliant. I said, is it the safest we could do? And I said, for a small incremental change here and there, this could be a lot safer. And they go, yeah, but you don't have to do that. You're compliant. I said, that doesn't matter. I said, I don't care about the, the Six Sigma event that's going to destroy everything. I'm concerned about when an operator turns this knob the wrong way, 
It doesn't matter. Well, to them it didn't matter because they were compliant, and so we wouldn't be negligent, but that's all they cared about, right? It's sort of like architects. They never go, okay, this is building spec, that's where we're gonna be. If you look at an architect, they're usually miles above the minimum specification for building because they don't want to toy with that line. And so it doesn't really cost that much, at least at this scale, to go the extra, to go the extra mile. Now, the, the, the difficult thing, though, is don't let the bureaucracy become that it takes six months to install a light switch. You know, that's the challenge, right? I mean, you can over-regulate something to the point where you can't get anything done, and it's having that right balance that, you know, how do you get it done, but how do you get it done safely? And we've never had, you know, any major issue, knock on wood. And so that's something we pride ourselves on, and, you know, we hope we have a, a stellar record going forward. So I think there's yeah. just a couple of last questions here. I, I just want to uh, have a quick question in first. Uh, we're, we're starting to run out of time here, but, uh, uh, Alex mentioned in this intro a little bit uh, that besides all the amazing work that you do at Materia, you're also the co-chair of Innovate Pasadena. So uh, do you want to take us uh, back a little bit to when the idea for Innovate Pasadena was started, how you got involved and kind of where Innovate Pasadena is today? Sure. Unfortunately, I don't have any short stories, so, um, so back in, I don't know when it was, probably 2003, 2000, probably around 2003, 2004, there was a previous organization called Entretech. Um, the, the executive director, Stephanie Anchinsky, approached me and said, hey, would you like to get involved? And I said, well, what is it? And I said, well, we're a nonprofit group that's trying to sort of help the ecosystem in, in Pasadena and work with startup companies and, and whatever. And I said, well, I do that already. You know, I get OTT refers everybody, you know, or get, I have a lot of referrals say, hey, how do you help them do this? How do you help them do that? So if I can do it on a broader basis, I'd love to get involved. Um, we put on the first green tech uh, in 2007. It was a big, uh, a big smashing hit in Pasadena. We did another one in 2008. Um, things were going well, but in the downturn, raising money for nonprofit was very, very difficult. And so we basically had a, to mothball the operation um, and just wait for the time to sort of have a rebirth. And then uh, it's probably about a year and a half ago now, um, uh, Andy Wilson uh, had been talking with uh, Eric Dyshar from the city of Pasadena. Coming, who, who is your co-chair? Who was the co-chair? Uh, well, yeah. at the time, it was just you know a, a citizen of Pasadena that wanted yeah. to take advantage of the assets that we have here and try to build something. Um, he saw he he's more on the uh, the IT side of things, and he saw Silicon Beach on the west side and things like that. It's like how come we don't have more of a recognition of the assets that we have here with the Art Center, with Caltech and JPL? It's just an embarrassment of riches. And so um, he came over one day, we started talking, I said, look, this is exactly what I've always, you know, what I've been wanting to do, and this is a great time to sort of restart things. We're, we're in recovery now. Um, I said the, the big issue is raising money, and uh, so it has to be a completely volunteer organization, and up until about, I don't know, three or four weeks ago, it's been 100% volunteer organization. And we have some great stakeholders, you know, Idea Lab and Caltech and, and, and Art Center, and um, the, go the goal is to really, uh, is an economic development engine is to really provide the 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 sort of the, the networking and the links between all the the entrepreneurs, the investors, the, the the companies, and really try to grow the ecosystem here and promote what we already have, and then go beyond that and sort of have an emergence of all those different things into something that's that's much more than the than the sum of the parts. Hmm. It's been going very well. Uh, there's an, at least an event a week, and sometimes two or three a week. Uh, we had a big launch event last June that was very popular. I think we had seven or eight hundred people sign up and about six hundred people show up at Twin Palms for our launch. We have, we have a great website if you haven't been to Innovate Passing a website. Uh, some of these talks are, are, are there on YouTube. Uh, there are events every week that you can go to, uh, networking events, a uh, number of other things, and it'll continue to grow as we go forward. We're just starting to raise uh, money for growing the organization, so that'll be pretty exciting. Uh, we were participating in the, uh, the Innovation Summit. Uh, we were, we were co-promoting that with, uh, with the Pasadena Magazine and had some, had some great uh, speakers at that event as well. So I'd say it's, a, it's, a, it's an organization that um, is looking to uh, you know, raise the tide uh, for, for all the ships in the, in, the, in, the, in the bay here in Pasadena. Yeah. And for anyone here in the audience or anyone watching this online afterwards, uh, who are interested in getting involved, uh, who is an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur uh, or a recovering entrepreneur, how, how do they go about getting in touch with uh, the organization or you for advice? Or uh, the website, drive yourself to the website. Uh, there's a way that you can um, send emails to it. You can get on the email mailing list. 
Um, I think uh, some of the, uh, there's, there's key email links on there for, for people and company links. I think we have listed well over 100 companies now that are in Pasadena area, which is great. So you can see the, the logo of the company, you, you, you click on it, you can give a little blurb about the company. And it, it's really trying to showcase what we have, but there's all kinds of ways of getting involved. We have a, a program innovators program where um, we're asking uh, entrepreneurs on the programming side, if they want to have a program you know, like this one, for instance, they can receive support or even funding from Innovate Pasadena to put a program together. And so there's been a lot of great innovation around that. Um, so we're really just trying to leverage the existing assets that we have here. And we're not, we're not trying to do the work for them. We're just trying to facilitate, if you will, be right. a catalyst for that, for that process. Yeah. Well, thank and there's you lots of ways work. to get involved. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, it's uh, innovatepasadena.org, right? Yes. Yes. But if you type Innovate Pasadena, you'll, you'll see it. It'll be the first, uh, first hit on Google. Right. Great. Alex? Yeah. So if you could go back in time with the knowledge... Don't, don't start with the go back in time. <laughs> no, I want to you know, know like... I, that's the second thing I do every morning, you know, after I read my email. Huh, so but go ahead. What mistakes do you think, like, you made when you started in the very first few years? Like I don't do have time to, to list that many. <laughs> uh, and I wouldn't say they're mistakes. Uh, I call them errors. Um, the difference between an error and a mistake is when you make the error over and over again, then it's a mistake. An error is just a data point. You know, uh, do you have an anecdote or something? Uh, something that I'd say early on, you learned. know, we were romanced by the pharmaceutical industry. We thought that was going to make the company. You know, like I said, shortly after we started making Catalyst, we were getting approached by all the companies, and we were getting purchase orders for a hundred thousand dollars here, a million dollars there. We thought, wow, this is, we're not even trying, and we're getting this. Imagine what it's going to be like. And so we really thought this is going to be big. And, and, then, and then things started dropping out of clinical trials, you know, one after another after another. I mean, we had, I think there were f at one time, five drugs in phase two clinical trials, and one after another dropped out of clinical trials. So um, one of the things was we weren't, we weren't uh, very well versed in that industry and understood the attrition rates, what was changing at the FDA, what was changing in the industry. Um, but whenever you go into a new area, it, it, you always get burned by the things you don't know. And so doing a lot of work up front, you know, more and more work up front about understanding the market, understanding the trends, understanding the, the critical features of that market in, in, the, in the business models that are accepted there and, and, and how to make that sale is, is very important. So more work up front is, is always better, but at the same time, you can't, you know, have paralysis through analysis either. You have to get out there and do something. You know, you can't, you know, if you, in science, if you don't know what to do, do something. At least you're going to get a result, and maybe that'll shed more light on, on what you're going to do next. All right, last question, anyone? Alex, last question? Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask one last question, sure. Uh, having started, uh, sort of grown and maintained a business here in Pasadena, are there certain things that you think are indicative or indigenous to this area that you might not find elsewhere? Or do you think, uh, you know, it just so happens that this came out of Caltech and you sort of stayed in the area? Anything you can tell us about that? No, I'd say this is a very, I mean, I've, I've been around the world in a lot of different ecosystems and I'd, and, you know, I grew up in Boston, um, in the city, and, you know, so people all, you know, give me a hard time all the time about, uh, you know, moving to California. Um, and they ask me what it's like out there, and I say, well, it's a lot like, I say, passing is a lot like Cambridge, and, in in, you know, that area where there's just a tremendous amount of, of this intellectual capital and institutions that are constantly generating, you know, innovation and excitement around that and entrepreneurship. Um, but the nice thing I like about here is sort of the difference between like, you know, MIT and Harvard versus Caltech is you, they do just as good at work, if not better here, but people are nice. It's just much, it's just much more laid back, you know, I mean, weather, it, it, but it's, the, it is the weather. I mean, I used to get grumpy having to shovel snow at 6 AM and having to trod through, you know, that and, and hot, humid summers, but it, it, it's, it's got all the benefits of a small town but all of, the, uh, all of the benefits of a big metropolis at the same time, the culture, the, 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 the technology, the people, the food, um, the fact that you're you know, so close to everything. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, they'll have to throw me out. I'm not leaving, you know? I mean, this is, this is a great place to be, you know? Wonderful. Well, uh, uh, I want to thank Jay for moderating the Q&A. Mike, uh, extend our warmest applause for you for having us uh, uh, be your guest tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you.